So, Professor Chandan Bose has already joined. Uh, welcome, sir. Thank you so much for joining. So, meanwhile, uh, we are waiting. Uh, maybe we can have an uh, ice breaking session with Professor Chandan. So, maybe you can uh, uh, introduce yourself and uh, the topic that you are going to cover, Dr. Chandan, so that uh, uh, they, they can also come up with some basic queries or they can also interact with you and whether they have any prior knowledge about the subject. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I was just waiting for the nod. So basically in today's session, uh, the topic that I've chosen to show you uh, might seem to be a bit advanced at this stage because I think that you have been uh, uh, taught what is the basic about open form and open form case directory etc and how to mesh in block mesh but in today's session uh, probably the area that i'm going to cover as part of this workshop uh, it involves external aerodynamics and when uh, we talk about aerodynamic problems on different shaped or, or shaped objects or different applications we know that uh, we often need to simulate an object or a body which is moving in the mesh, uh, right? And we need to understand what type of aerodynamic uh, loads act on those kind of moving bodies. And to simulate those moving objects, we need a specific capability of open foam, which is called dynamic meshing strategy. And it's a vast area and there are many, many different options of doing it, uh, which I will just, you know, touch the very, uh, I'll scratch the surface of it and show you different capabilities. And then at the end of this session, uh, we'll together, I think you will be shared with a case, particular case of a flapping airfoil, which I will explain what are the files and you will be assisted with one of our colleague to simulate that on your own computer. So this is the basic structure of this session it will be, and particularly which I will be showing you would basically for your knowledge on what are the different type of dynamic meshing strategies and what are the different ways that we can simulate external aerodynamics problem. And during my session, I would try to go as slow as possible and try to show you some hands-on simulations that I have already uh, simulated because it's not possible to simulate during the session and show you. But also I'll try to explain you those settings, solver settings, case directories, etc. But you need not try it while I'm doing it. So in the first uh, one and a half to two hours of this session, you uh it will be on a presentation mode where you will be seeing different capabilities of open form and their settings etc however you don't need to try it on your own because it's not possible to focus on this presentation as well as try it on your own um, at the end of my session you will have the chance to uh try a moving body problem of a flapping airfoil on your own in your computer and you will be assisted by our colleagues. Does that make sense? Yes. So, uh, yes, yes. I think we can start now. So, just let me uh, briefly introduce uh, Professor Chandan. He is our advisor of the Open Form team of FOSI IT Bombay, and he is a faculty member in the University of Birmingham, uh, UA, UK. So, um, that's a very brief introduction, but. Uh, uh, if, if you go to LinkedIn and browse his page, you will get to know more about him. Okay, so uh, without uh, taking much of your time, uh, we can just start the session. All right. Uh, thanks, Pyle, for your kind introduction. Uh, so Thank I'm anyway going to tell a brief uh, details of what I do. Uh, so uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chandan, and I'm an assistant professor of uh, aerospace engineering in the University of Birmingham, UK. And uh, my research interests broadly lie in the areas of unsteady aerodynamics, nonlinear dynamics, and fluid structure interaction. And I am a computational researcher by nature. So I do all my research mostly through simulation and a bit 
bits and pieces of experiments and I collaborate with other experimentalists. Now, before I go into uh, the details of this session and show you some interesting simulation on how you can tackle external aerodynamics problems, I should acknowledge uh, that this tutorial has been prepared with the help of my colleague, Joel. Um, he is an assistant professor in University of Genoa, and he, as you all know, that he is very famous, and he is the CTO of Ulp Dynamics. Uh, so we both offered a similar uh, workshop in the Open Form workshop back to back last two years. So I thought that will be very interesting to also offer the similar training here, so that as part of this workshop, as you know, it's a quite diverse workshop uh, consisting of different areas. And my session would probably, uh, I hope that it will help you to gain some knowledge about uh, fluid dynamics related to aeronautical problems, fluid dynamics related to civil engineering, fluid dynamics related to any kind of external aerodynamics problem that uh, you might be interested. So, before I start, uh, I think what I always do is, um, have you ever simulated a, a problem, external aerodynamics problem in open form? You can quickly put in chat, what have you simulated, if yes, and whether it involved any sort of dynamic missing or miss movement. Right, so I think the responses that I'm getting uh, quickly is that yes, some of the people are have done it, such as for example, Scramjet, uh, and most of the people have not done it. So I think that's good. So that's the point of uh, putting this session in so that you get a basic uh, understanding of how these problems are set up. All right, thank you for responding. Uh, so going forward, uh, I actually uh, head a laboratory which is called Bio-Inspired Fluid Structure Interaction Laboratory in the Aerospace Engineering of University of Birmingham. And basically uh, what my interest lies, as I said, uh, the fluid structure interaction problems that drives inspiration from nature, such as insect flight, fish swimming, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, in, in future, if any of you are interested to pursue these kind of problems, please feel free to get in touch. And before, the last thing before I start today's actual topic, I wanted to give you these two links. Uh, I will share the links, but please note it down if you really want to learn open form uh, further. So these two are the, I think, most resourceful repository uh, along with our FOSI case studies, CFD case studies, uh, where the first link is the official tutorial link of OpenFOAM, uh, which is uh, managed by OpenCFD and uh, the OpenFOAM governance. So this tutorial link will give you a lot of resources to learn OpenFOAM uh, throughout, from scratch to a very advanced level. Right, so before, so as, before I again show you and start with a basic uh, problem, uh, I would want you to again remind that today, whatever I will be going to show you, uh, you need not try with me in the first session. You will have a chance to simulate a flapping foil like what you see in this animation where we give a prescribed motion to an airfoil shaped body and you can see that the mace deforms. Uh, so we have prepared a similar setup for you to try on your computer and you will be given the case setup and the uh, recording of the explanation of the case directory by our colleague and they will assist you to simulate it. Now, in the first session, what I will mostly focus on I will tell you what is a dynamic mess and what are the kind of different ways or different strategies that uh, that are incorporated within open foam and the examples of different dynamic messing strategies that I will basically briefly touch upon are mess morphing, overset messes, 
moving meshes, sliding meshes, and adaptive mesh refinement. Now, as you can see that this is a vast topic, vast collection of topics, and each of these can actually, I can take two hours to explain. So my session would be, again, very superficial, but I will try to show you as much as possible on how to set up this kind of problem. And at the end of the simulation, what type of results you get and how you can visualize the mesh motion uh, in these different approaches. But mostly what I'll spend much time uh, is on mesh morphing and overset meshes. And I'll try to explain you what are the different kind of uh, numerical schemes and what are the different kind of uh, requirement of this kind of simulations that you have to keep in mind. All right. Now, again, this is a very beginner level introductory training session. So I will not really explain you uh, each and every theoretical aspect of it because of the shortage of time. But I still feel that some of you or a majority of you are just starting with open form, if I am correct, then it might seem to be a bit difficult at this stage. Uh, so please, please feel free to stop me and ask if you have any queries. Now, again, for the first session, whatever simulation results I will be showing are based on the open CFD version and they are tested uh, up to version 2306. But please keep in mind that I know I'm aware that this workshop uh, is actually promoting the version nine of open uh, form foundation version. So in the next session, the tutorial that you will be given is set up as per the foundation version of version nine. And so you will be able to run it. But the bottom line is that the capabilities that I'm going to show you that are covered in any of the forks of open form, but there will be minor changes in terms of setup, which would not be very difficult if you can understand the underlying principle of the algorithms and how the solvers work. And you are not expected to run any cases during this session. And please feel free to post your queries in the chat, but I may not be able to uh, read it uh, on the runtime. However, you can unmute yourself and ask me questions without interrupting the session. Thank you. So again, the ice breaking in terms of these technicalities of this session on, I just wanted to make sure if after the first day of this workshop, you have understood the case directory or any typical simulation case, how to set it up or not. Can you please uh, type in the chat box? Yes, no, maybe. I expect that you have been uh, already given the training on how to set up a cavity case. And you have also learned how to mesh in block mesh, etc. So just to repeat in a couple of seconds that any tutorial case or any case setup while we uh, prepare for the simulation in open form, we majorly have three different folders within the case setup. One is zero folder, another is constant folder, another is system folder. And can anybody quickly tell why this zero folder is named as zero and the constant folder is named as constant? I always ask these questions before I give any Training. So zero folder contains the initial and boundary conditions for the variables. Perfect. And, and constant yes. folder uh, consists of the constant properties uh, of the foods. Right. Perfect. So so basically, the in the within the zero folder, we basically define the initial and boundary condition of our state variables, such as for example the kind the class of problems that I'm going to show you they are incompressible, mostly incompressible fluid problems. And for that, we have majorly uh, two state variables, which, which are pressure and velocity. 
and in some cases there can be temperature so we have to you, you can see that within this zero folder we will have two files one is pressure p another is velocity u and within those scripts we define the initial and boundary condition now the constant folder as mentioned by one of you very uh, accurately that we keep the informations mostly which are not changing through our simulations right which remains constant throughout our simulation for example my transport properties that means for example my kinematic viscosity of the fluid which will remain constant throughout the simulation we keep it within the constant folder the another important thing that we keep within the constant folder that is uh, the mesh information and you can see that always if you prepare the mesh through the block mesh dict or if you import the mesh from any third party software such as you make a mesh in um, icmcfd or you make a mesh in salome or ansys and then you import it to open form that will create a folder called polymes which will have all these informations such as points faces neighbors boundaries etc and it is very important because the names that you denote to the patches or the boundaries in the maze has to match in your zero folder when you provide the boundaries uh, condition and initial condition otherwise you will always get errors now can you tell me what is the other file that we might have in the constant apart from the mesh information which is in polymesh and transport properties such as kinematic viscosity density etc there can be another file within the constant folder which we might have if we need any idea about it the turbulence models file right yes exactly so if we want to include the turbulence modeling in our simulations such as uh, such as basically if it is if we want to mention if it is laminar if it is ran simulation if it is uh, les simulation then we need another file which is called turbulence properties or again in the foundation version it is termed as momentum transport within that we have to define the turbulence model if we want to and which class of turbulence model that we want to use okay and then the most important folder is called system which has my runtime controls such as start time end time time stepping whether we want to use adaptive time stepping whether we want to use some sort of function objects so such as to calculate forces uh, everything is defined within the file control dict and we have every solution and every schemes where we give our cfd discretization schemes and the solution methods for our linear equations that comes from the discretized governing equation for example navier stokes equation all right so i hope that this is pretty clear after the first day of the workshop and you have already run some simulations on cavity problem maybe some other so can someone tell me what is the navier stokes solver that you have used till now in the tutorials that you have run isoform and uh, psychoform right anything else simple form simple <laughs> form so if not we will be using today another another uh, solver which is called pimple foam all right so so what is the difference between ico foam and simple foam ico foam is transient and uh, simple foam is steady state uh, but with the turbulence properties ico foam doesn't have the turbulence ones right yes i mean loosely that's correct so we will be using today another solver called pimple foam uh, again it is a transient turbulent solver which can incorporate different turbulence models but the algorithm is different because 
in simple form we use the simple algorithm to di uh, to discretize and solve the governing equation uh, but in pimple form we use pimple algorithm which is a kind of hybrid algorithm of piso and simple um, to solve the discretized governing equation all right let's go ahead and the second thing i wanted to ensure before i go into the actual problem of dynamic missing uh, strategies or external aerodynamics problem is uh, how many of you have seen this governing equation for the icofoam solver or not so do you have an idea what is the governing equation that we actually discretize and solve and how it is done in open foam I'm sure it has been covered in the basics of finite volume uh, session yesterday. So if we can see the C source file of this solver, then this is there inside that. Yes. So, so if some of you do not have the idea on what are we actually going to solve by this icofoam or pimple foam or simple foam, I would strongly encourage you to go through the source code and see what it is doing because that is what makes OpenFoam uh, special from other commercial software such as ANSYS, uh, where you cannot see this source code. But as being as op being an open source uh, code in OpenFoam, you can actually go to the source code and see each and every line of the code and what it is doing and how it is doing. Now, just to give an idea that. Uh, in today's session, whatever problems we'll be solving, uh, they will be incompressible Navier-Stokes solver. So this transport equation, which is a scalar transport equation, as you can see in these slides, uh, will take a form of incompressible Navier-Stokes so solver, where my density of the fluid remains constant. And then we will use actually the pimple algorithm to discretize this equation uh, and solve it and the discretization of this partial differential equation would take ultimately a form of a linear equation such as ax equal to b and then we will solve x equal to a inverse b through different linear solvers that I will show you later what are the solvers that we are using and while doing it the namespace of foam which is the namespace of open foam contains different classes and objects and function uh, and within the finite volume class we have two different objects or two different uh, uh, classes that define different objects one is fvc and fvm and the fvc uh, represents the finite volume calculus which does all the calculations of explicit type and the FVM, the finite volume method class, represents the implicit type of calculation. Uh, so in this particular scalar transport equation, you can actually see that we use this solve function uh, to solve the discretized governing equation. And some of them are some of the functions such as DDT, which solves the derivative with respect to time, div which solves the divergence laplacian which solves the laplacian function grad which solves the gradient function uh, some of them are within the class of fbm and some of them are within the class of fbc that's because the ddt div and laplacian you can see that they are implicit because we have some parameters such as rho phi mu within the function however the gradient of pressure can be calculated explicitly that's why they fall under the category of finite volume calculus or fvc right so this uh, i wanted to just make sure that you know what is the governing equation that we are going to solve and how we are incorporating our dynamic messing technique within this governing equation and how is it going to change right so that's something we should have a clear idea before we start doing simulations. Uh, so can you just uh, explain the last uh, thing, the FVM and FVC part? Right. So the finite volume methodology, the way it is uh, it is coded within the open form framework has different classes 
and objects right and functions now the there are two classes one is fvc another is fvm now fvc class has all the functions which can do explicit calculations right so for example ddt of a where there is no implicit parameters to be calculated so it is not dependent implicitly on anything else for example gradient of pressure in this case however when we have we have to do ddt of rho comma u for example and this rho can be a function of space and time right in some cases and then in when we calculate this discretized form of time derivative we have to do these calculations implicitly depending on rho that's why this then we have to take the objects from the class of fvm which are capable of doing implicit calculations so the bottom line of showing this slide was that the governing equation that we will be solving or discretizing and then solving uh, might have different terms such as so in this scalar transport equation we see we have a temporal term we have a convective term we have a diffusion term and we have a gradient term gradient of pressure right so depending on the situation like whether it is incompressible or compressible or anything else depending on different condition of your problem uh, we might have these terms can be explicit or implicit and depending on that we have to uh, solve it right and we have to take the objects and functions from the appropriate classes that's why it is important to know where we will use a vm class and where we will use a vc class clear yes sir thank you any other question at this point right okay so quickly let's start our actual session i took this half an hour because i wanted to make sure that later on what i'm going to show you are actually making sense to you and you can relate it or link it with the previous sessions that you have till now all right so now what is dynamic meshing so dynamic meshing strategies actually allow mesh motion for accommodating you know moving bodies or deformations right so and so how does my scalar transport equation change in this case so in this case apart from my flow velocity u when my mesh is moving or mesh is deforming or the body is moving accommodating the mesh motion we have another velocity term so we in in our convective term of our in our governing equation instead of the absolute flow velocity our velocity becomes a relative velocity where the relative velocity is the difference between the flow velocity and the mesh velocity or the grid velocity all right so this is where my governing equation change and this incorporation of the mesh velocity uh, can be done in different ways that is what we are actually going to see today and this can be achieved through morphing uh, where morphing a uh, mesh morphing means where basically my meshes will deform to accommodate the body motion okay it can be achieved through adding or removing new cells it can be achieved through sliding the a portion of the mesh i will show you examples of all this uh sliding one component of the mesh with another component of the mesh it can be achieved through overset meshes where basically we have multiple disconnected mesh components uh, merged one over another and any components or any sub components of these meshes can move uh, within the eulerian background mesh okay so these are the different ways that we can actually uh achieve this mesh motion now let us have some example of uh what i mean by this dynamic mesh motion right 
and then also it inherently brings the questions what are these dynamic meshes useful for why do we need them so we need dynamic meshes for different type of simulation to achieve different problem statements such as if the first example shows you what is a mesh morphing okay and uh, within that you see that a cylinder a cylindrical structure in two dimension is undergoing a translational motion with a prescribed body motion it's a oscillatory displacement motion that we can code or we can use a function to tell the simulation that i want to move my body with for example a oscillatory motion of a sin omega t where i want to prescribe the amplitude of the motion and the frequency of the motion and you can see in this mesh motion algorithm when the body is moving within your simulation the connected grids or the mesh components are getting deformed the grid cells are getting deformed to accommodate uh, this body motion there is not any additional uh, creation or destruction of the grid cells there is no motion of any sub components of the meshes there is one single mesh which uh, incorporates the deformation of its grid cells to accommodate the body motion clear so this is what is termed as mesh morphing now the second type is called sliding so you can see which is achieved through a boundary condition called ami which is called arbitrary mesh interface motion uh, where you can see that i have two component of this pitching airfoil pitching means rotating airfoil and here also i am giving a prescribed kinematics of a sin a sin omega t for example where i am mentioning the amplitude and the frequency of the rotation of this air of this airfoil however my mesh has two different components one is the inner circular mesh here you can see and the other one is outer background mesh and the inner circular mesh actually slides over the outer mesh component through a boundary where we apply this arbitrary mesh interface boundary condition all right so this the other one i will show you later is called overset motion i'll actually explain it in more details so these kind of problems are actually the external aerodynamics problem with prescribed body motion however we can also incorporate the fluid structure interaction uh into it which means that the motion of the body is not prescribed but it is induced by the flow separation around the body by the vertical structures that is getting generated by the motion of the body and then in turn the displacement of the body changes the pressure difference around the body and also changes the flow um parameters and then it goes on coupled in a coupled manner where the structure and the fluid interacts in every time step okay so uh, that is another class of problem which is fluid structure interaction that we can actually uh, simulate the yeah before i take the question the last type is called mesh refinement or unrefinement which is an example of creation or destruction of additional cells as we can as we want to capture the phenomena so in the third case you can see it's called adaptive mesh refinement where a bubble for example in this case when it goes up uh, when we actually want to capture the boundary of such moving body uh, we want to actually refine the meshes locally around that for example this bubbles based on a scalar variable which is important right and then when it just merges and does different kind of physics uh, exhibits different kind of physics we create new cells or distract uh, the others unwanted cells to actually capture the phenomena all right so these are the different ways by which we can capture the other one is overset mo mesh motion 
which I will explain now. Now, for example, I have here, I'm showing you three different ways of simulating the same problem, which you will also do uh, today, hands-on on your own, compu uh, own computer by the second method, which is called mesh morphing, all right? But however, so the first one, as I tell, uh, as I told already, it's called sliding mesh approach using the arbitrary mesh interfaces. You can see that we have uh, an inner component of the mesh which slides over an Eulerian outer component of the mesh. The second one, as I've already told, is called mesh morphing, where you can see that the mesh cells or the cell regions they get deformed as the body moves. And the third type, which I have not explained yet, is called overset mesh. And the basics of overset mesh is that we have multiple disconnected mesh regions within the simulation region. So I have an Eulerian background mesh, which is not moving at all. And I have another component of the mesh, which is moving with the prescribed or fluid induced motion. However, uh, we are solving the Navier-Stokes equation everywhere, right? But the solution from this disconnected outer mesh, outer region of mesh, which is called the overset mesh region, gets interpolated to the Eulerian background mesh at the overset surfaces, all right? And this is very useful if we want to simulate very high amplitude problems, uh, and multiple body moving in the same region, which becomes impossible by this middle approach, which is mesh morphing. Because if you can imagine that you want to have a tandem airfoil of two airfoils rotating, and if they, for example, rotates in a counter direction, one clockwise, another anti-clockwise, at the juncture or at the middle portion, the cells will be stretched too much that the non-orthogonality or the skewness of those cells will, you know, uh, cross the tolerance that you have provided and your simulation will diverge. So depending on the nature of your problem and depending on what type of mesh motion you want to incorporate, uh, we have to choose the right way or the right strategy uh, within our simulation. All right. So I will pause a bit at this stage and take any questions if you have any confusion. Do you have any confusion at this stage? Yes, sir. Uh, I just want to ask one thing. Uh, this arbitrary mesh interface, if we are preparing this mesh using any software, then uh, whether we have to prepare geometry in two different parts which are not overlapping? No. In the arbitrary mesh uh, interface? Oh, yeah. I mean, the rotating sorry, part and uh, the stationary I, part. Let me understand your question clearly. So you are asking whether you have two different component of the mesh or not? Yes, I want to prepare a mesh in some software. So I need a geometry in which I have to model this rotating domain separately and the stationary domain separately. Yes, you can do that. You can, you can actually create this inner circle and the outer annular circle separately and create the mesh and then import the meshes in open form and merge them together. So <laughs> open form has a very powerful uh, capability of merging different meshes together. So you can prepare your different meshes in different softwares, for example. For example, you create this background annular region in block mesh and the inside rotating region in ANSYS. You can still import both of them and merge them together. Only thing you have to take care is that your boundaries uh, are named properly and are linked to the boundary condition properly, such as it is referred to as arbitrary mesh interface clearly in your boundary file, as well as in your zero folder where you mention the boundary condition. Okay, sir. So these are not overlapping. There is a common interface uh, which is joining. Yes, the two. overlapping case is the overset method. Okay. So in the AMI case, there is no overlapping region. They are two separate mesh. The inside is a circular mesh. The outside is an annular mesh, which okay. fits the in, in inner circle. And then the inner circle actually slides 
over the background mesh using this arbitrary mesh interface boundary condition. That's the difference between sliding mesh and the overset mesh. Sir, if we have a larger domain in which uh, the rotating domain is completely covered, so uh, suppose a cylindrical domain, so it has three faces. So we have to set up all the AMI interfaces separately or in, within one AMI, one and two. I don't understand your question. So uh, the cylindrical domain uh, is inside uh, a bigger domain and uh, there are three faces, the top, bottom and the cloud uh, face, which are uh, common to both. Cylindrical domain, how, how is it three faces? Suppose, I don't understand. Uh, the, the complete cylinder, uh, like uh, this is a 2D case. Suppose we are doing it in 3D and the in rotating domain is completely covered by another domain, stationary domain. Right. So, so in if you want to do in a 3D case, you have to define in a way that that all the surfaces have the boundary condition to slide. So it is a bit difficult uh, to create. I mean, you have to design your domain and mesh in a way that they can slide over one another. And what whichever surface you want to slide has to have this boundary condition called AMI. Okay, now, the design see. of the problem, uh, you have to think about it. So I cannot imagine clearly what you okay. are mentioning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. So if there are... So I have one small question. Yes. So re regarding this adaptive meshing, so like you mentioned in governing equation, there will be a term of the mesh motion that is being modified. Now, in adaptive type of meshing, is there really any motion of the mesh? I mean, it's just local refinement, like it's growing. Yes, and exactly. Vanishing. So uh, the governing equation that I showed that does not apply for adaptive mesh motion. Okay. You are right. So right. in the adaptive mesh motion, as I think I mentioned that we do a local refinement by creating or destroying the cell sizes. So I will show you the how to set it up and I will explain what are the parameters that we need. Uh, for for actually simulating an adaptive mesh refinement, depending on how much time I have, I'm left with. Okay, understood. understood. Yeah. Yes. So the you are perfectly uh, have captured the point that the mesh velocity, the relative velocity in the convective term, that applies for other class of problems. The other classes. Morphing yes. AMI overset, but yes. not the adaptive mesh refinement. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Uh, good morning. Good morning. So my question is about the overset mesh. Since we don't have any interface which separates the moving zone and the rotating zone, how does the information transfer between two zones? The information is transferred through interpolation at the overset surface. So you can see that here in the overset mesh, which contains the foil, inside the foil, there is no grid cells, right? Because it's a rigid body. And we want to calculate the flow parameters around that airfoil shaped obstruction. However, the mesh zone that is moving, uh, which is called overset mesh, has a surface which uh, has an outer surface, right? So the inner surface is the airfoil, which is a moving wall boundary condition, or it's a wall. So it has no, no normal boundary condition. However, the outer surface of this moving zone, which is overset zone, is termed as overset patch. Or because we apply the overset boundary condition there, which enables the interpolation of the field variables from the overset zone to the background zone. That is how it transfers the information. And are these interpolations similar to central differencing or upwinding schemes? that we use for advection and other properties? No, inter. there are a set of quite well-established interpolation schemes within OpenFOAM, such as, I will show you what are the options, such as inverse distance, <laughs> such as uh, cell volume, weight, etc., etc. So there are specific interpolation schemes defined for overset algorithm within OpenFOAM. So I don't think central differencing is an interpolation uh, scheme in that sense. So we have dedicated separate other interpolation schemes for overset cases. Thank you. Right. So then how do we actually incorporate this? 
mesh motion within our open form simulation right so in open form all these dynamic mesh capabilities are controlled by a directory uh, or sorry a dictionary within the constant direct which is placed normally within the constant directory is called dynamic mesh dict now apart from when i explain what are the files that are consisting of this constant folder this is the other file which we need if our simulations actually involve dynamic mesh motion so this is dynamic mesh dict uh, where we define the type of dynamic mesh motion we want to use and where we give all the libraries and parameters needed for this dynamic mesh motion uh, to be achieved within the simulation right now when we do a moving body simulation it's quite intuitive that we have to assign a motion type to a particular either to a particular patch or to a volume of cells or to the whole domain so this is very important to understand that we can either move a patch such as when we create the maze we name the patch of an airfoil as airfoil and then we tell that i want to move that patch with a prescribed motion or with flow induced vibration apart from that the other option is that we can mark a volume of cells and name them as a particular cell zone and then apply the motion on that cell zone and the third option is that we can move the whole domain itself so for example my whole problem domain itself is a sphere right and i want to move that whole sphere with with a given prescribed motion or some other type of uh, predefined motions now the other the the class of mesh uh, dynamic mesh problem which is very different from all these three classes as we just discussed is the adaptive mesh refinement right because in adaptive refi uh, mesh refinement we are actually not moving the mesh in that sense but we are incorporating the motion of a body such as a droplet right by a particular refinement criteria based on a scalar field this is very important that we have to find out what is the scalar field based on which we have to create or refine locally the cells or destroy the cells when that scalar field a value goes below a particular threshold that we defined right and the last thing is that when we apply body motion to a particular patch or wall our boundary condition has to be appropriate we cannot give a fixed value boundary condition or a, a gradient i mean newman type of boundary condition such as zero gradient we have to give one of these two boundary condition one is either moving wall velocity when we have predefined prescribed motion or calculated type of boundary condition where we do not know how the body is moving but the motion of the body is getting determined uh, due to the flow separations or vortices or the flow field change of flow field around the body right so these are the basic pillars of setting up one dynamic mesh motion case uh, to simulate an external aerodynamics problem any question about this i see one hand raised ah uh, sir i have a question uh, if this adaptive mesh refinement works only for hexahedral meshes right in open form why is so what, what uh, is i heard i came to know delta. like that i uh, uh mostly we use unstructured meshes uh but i don't think there is any specific link to a particular type of mesh i mean i i'm not aware of it okay because in some tutorial i came to know that to work solely in extracurricular meshes proper form right so it okay. might be so i mean i i am uh, not aware of it all right so let's go ahead uh, let's go to a particular case case now such as uh, such as the moving cylinder case and i can explain you what are the different setups of this case and etc 
but before we do so we also have to know one important thing that what are the different uh, libraries or what are the different solvers that we can actually use which has the capability of mesh motion so not all the solvers or not all the applications of open form has the capability of mesh motion but in theory each of them has so in theory you can adapt those solvers with a dynamic mesh motion case but you have to incorporate uh, appropriate libraries to do so so uh, i hope you every one of you know what is a wm project directory which is basically your installation directory and within that we have multiple folders one of them is applications and within applications we have a folder called solvers and within the solvers if you just do this command in your uh, command in your terminal that grep dynamics fbmesh.h which is the basic uh, the fundamental library of dynamic mesh motion you should be able to see these are the different solvers that or these are the different libraries sorry that you can use for mesh motion strategy right and let us now look into the motion solvers and one of the class of the dynamic mesh motion solver is six degree of freedom uh, rigid body motion which is used mostly for fluid structure interaction cases so we can look look into it so let's let's try to look into this kind of location so before we use them we should also know where they are located right so let us try to go and look into it um, to do that i will try to share uh, my workstation so i will just create a terminal uh, and so again i will be uh, mostly showing you the cases with the open cfd version uh, however everything is literally same for your foundation version so later on you can try the same things so i will basically first load the basrc file and for that i have created an alias already uh, which is named open form 2306 that means i am actually loading the executable for version 2306 and if i just go to my installation directory which is basically dollar wm project directory let's see where do we go so so my installation directory is this for particularly for my system it can be the path can be very different for you particularly if you are using windows subsystem linux it will be located somewhere slash opt slash open form slash something so within that if we see we have multiple folders in the installation directory and knowingly or unknowingly you have basically compiled all these c++ codes to install open form now how many of you have seen this directory before all right so many of you have seen it that's that's a good thing so basically this is my installation directory within that i have application folder and within the not allowing me okay within the application folder we see that we have a solver so somehow uh, it's zoom is interfering with my any desk and not allowing me to do things i want to do so please bear with me yeah so within the application folder we have a folder called solvers and within the solvers you can see that all the solvers in they are located in different folders right so within that as i said if you if you grab the dynamic fbms it will basically show you 
what are the kind of what are the solvers that have been linked with dynamic mesh motion if some of the solvers that you want to use which does not link with dynamic mesh motion libraries you can still link it by sourcing or by uh, calling some of the libraries some of the header files in your solver so is this clear where your solvers are located and where you can do it so you can see that apart from uh, application there is also a folder called src okay and within this src file which i was trying to show that there there is a folder called dynamic mesh and within the dynamic mesh you have uh, so let me try to do it again um, but my keyboard is has been changed for some reason so i'm not finding the correct symbols okay so if i go directly to so basically you know that we have other aliases such as src which directly takes me to the source code folder and let us see what are the folders we have right so within this source code you can see that there is a folder called dynamic mess there there are other folders called dynamic fv mess these are the library files or the source code relating to the dynamic meshing that we will be using all right so if i try to go to that dynamic mesh folder you can see what are the folders within that within the dynamic mesh folder you can see there are different type of dif different source codes that uh, we normally use for this dynamic mesh pro problem and within which one one folder which is very important to us is called motion solvers because this is the motion solvers that we are going to use in our cases in our tutorial cases right so if we if i go to motion solvers folder we can see that we have again different type of motion solvers that we can use uh, some are based on displacement some are based on velocity etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, motion solver velocity so if we just look into it what are the solver available within different folders uh, we go to the displacement folder and we can see that there are solid body motion solvers there are interpolation based motion solver displacement based motion solver etc etc okay so is that clear of where these codes are located or do you have any doubt about this path okay and again within the motion solver we have a main code c code and a header file for all these codes so if for example the the motive of me showing you all these paths and location of the codes is that if you want to modify if you take a template of any of this motion solver and want to modify according to your need of your simulation you can actually do so so you can take this code from here and then modify the code and recompile it to make your own mesh motion solver. Right. So, well, that, I think that's enough uh, for, for the introduction of this. So, is it clear? Um, is it clear? No, I have a doubt. Yes. So, um, when we talk about UDF and ANSYS Fluent, is it the same as going to the source code and changing whatever we want in the code udf is a user defined function which can be used for many many different things in ansys fluent because you cannot see the actual source code in ansys fluent right it is just gives you a, a tool to incorporate some of your codes into the main code but in open form you are basically um, can see each and every code but the already existing repository is not the solution of 100% of your problems. You can always think of a new problem to give a new type of uh, trajectory or kinematics, which is not incorporated uh, within the standard functions of open form, right? So in that case, you might want to code that particular motion that is required for your problem. And for that, what I mean is that you can take one of these mesh motion solvers source code as template. 
and then you modify it. You don't really have to code it from scratch everything. You modify it and you can always recompile it to create your own mesh motion solver. Does this make sense? Yeah, right. Thank you. Um, if a mesh, if a rigid body is moving near a boundary, what kind of dynamic meshing should I use? Uh, so you can actually use many different type. You can use mesh morphing. You can also use overset mesh, mesh method. I think overset mesh method would be more appropriate in this case, but whether if it's a near a wall or anything that depends on the boundary condition. So you have to set the boundary conditions appropriately and also tune your solver setup, your CFD schemes, your tolerances, uh, your everything of the solver so that the solver doesn't diverge. Mostly when a body is near the boundary, it uh, can suit up your you know current number, for example, and then your solution will diverge. So you have to tune your solver setup for that. Uh, right. Uh, mesh preparation is same for AMI and MRF. Uh, yes, MRF, multiple rotating fr frame actually, framework actually use some sort of sliding mesh. So it they are similar. All right. So I think we have spent one hour. And in the next one hour, I want to show you some of the examples and how to incorporate, what are the syntaxes of this kind of incorporating this kind of mesh motion, all right? So uh, let us go ahead with my presentation and we will see. So now you know where these codes are located. So it's not, you don't really have to do things blindly. You can always go into the directories and see what, what is the code and how to modify it if needed. Right. So the important, another important aspect, the, the thing that I was just telling that depending on what class of dynamic mesh motion problem you are using, your numerics or the solver setup needs to be adjusted or needs to be tuned appropriately so that your solution does not diverge. Right. So the one kind of CFD schemes or one type of solver uh, setup that works for mesh morphing may not work for, for example, overset mesh method or may not work for your adaptive mesh refinement. So depending on the class of dynamic mesh motion, you need to tune your solver setup. And also it is very specific to the problem that you are trying to address. Okay. And for that, more than open foam, you need to know what are the fundamental principles of fluid mechanics. What do you mean by that boundary condition? Okay. So often I see that people just want to do CFD as a, as a blind skill of clicking some buttons, such as using any commercial code, uh, even without going through the basics of fluid mechanics course. So, so if you really take a challenging problem, your blind approach will not really work. First of all, you need to know what are the basic governing equations of uh, fluid mechanics such as Navier-Stokes equation? How do you discretize them? What are the boundary conditions that are needed to actually give convergence to the solution scheme that you are using, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right? And accordingly, you have to tune your mesh size, time steps, time step size, and the CFD discretization schemes and the linear solvers. Uh, to converge to an accurate solution. Otherwise, it will be just, you know, junk input and junk output. So you you are not, I mean, open form is not a human being, right? So it's just a library of C++ code. So whatever you will give input, you will get output. If your code can understand some parameters. But whether the, that solution is correct or not, you have to apply your fluid mechanics knowledge to understand it. Right. So, for example, dynamic when you use dynamic mesh or a dynamic meshing or moving body problem compared to a stationary body problem, uh, they need more stringent stability and accuracy requirement. 
because your mace is moving all right and uh, it will involve either deformation of the mace cells such as change in the cell volumes uh, with time with time like every time step your volumes of the cells changes and particularly for mace morphing approach and which may lead to many times may lead to a negative cell volume error and that's why when you use a very high deformation problems uh, your solution may diverge because due to the high deformation of your body or high amplitude or frequency of the motion of your body uh, your mace cells may get stretched deformed uh, to a very high skewness and non orthogonality leading to negative volume issues and which will lead to immediate divergence of your solution right so during the simulation with moving bodies the boundary mesh domain will experience strong instantaneous acceleration large displacement deformation and fluctuations in the linear angular velocity which can trigger a strong suit up in your um, residuals and it can diverge your simulations particularly for adaptive mesh refinement simulations the mesh will change and the cells will become smaller and smaller uh, so it can also lead to a cell volume issue therefore the cfl number if you are aware of it the current number uh, will change from refinement level to refinement level and we have to uh, take care of it with appropriate cfd schemes also it is extremely important to control the cfl number uh, to give the stability to the CFD schemes that you use or the solution scheme that you use uh, for solving your discretized governing equation. And it is also recommended to monitor the mesh quality when dealing with morphing meshes. As I told, whether the skewness or the not the non-orthogonality is increasing uh, way too much beyond the accuracy of the solution which it requires, right? And of course. I mean, this concept, uh, I have seen many people are confused about it. When you use a moving body problem uh, involving dynamic meshes, the simulations are intrinsically unsteady. So there is no point that my simulation can be a steady simulation. All right. So it's very intuitive. Right. And again, another intuitive corollary is that simulation with dynamic meshes are computationally very, very much expensive. So now I will basically quickly go through each class of these problems and show you the setup. So uh, in mesh morphing, which is also known as mesh diffusion or mesh smoothing, uh, we actually can use either the predefined function or we can use a tabulated motion uh, for moving the body. And as well as as I mentioned before, we can also use fluid structure interaction using six degree of freedom motion solver, where the body motion will be dictated by the unsteady flow separation around the body, right? And of course, with morphing maces, large displacement with large time uh, with large time steps uh, will likely result in a low quality maces or invalid maces, or the solution will diverge so the the monitoring of the cfl number is very important in this case and the time step must be chosen in such a way that it allows for a smooth mesh motion diffusion so where is this diffusion located in the mesh morphing so if i go back and show you this uh video in the mesh morphing uh can anybody tell me what do you mean by the diffusion in this case? If you have understood what, how mesh morphing works. Anybody? Any idea? What do you mean by diffusion of the mesh deformation in case of mesh morphing? So when we morph the mesh, we basically have to have to have another governing equation which allows the mesh to deform. All right. And in most of the cases, we use a Laplacian diffusion equation uh, to handle this kind of mesh morphing. And 
which is governed by a diffusivity constant of the diffusion equation, all right? And depending on that diffusivity constant, we basically diffuse the deformation from of those cells from near the body to the outside. So you can see that in this case, particularly, the cells near the airfoil, you can see are deforming and rotating a lot. But slowly as you go outward in the radial direction, the deformation of the cells are reducing. And after some point outside, you do not see any deformation of the cells. So, which basically gives you the idea that uh, that the there is a diffusivity constant which allows to diffuse this mesh deformation as we go from near to the body to outside. Is that clear? So that is what it is meant here. Right. Uh, so what is the solver setup? in case of my mesh morphing uh, case. So as I have already told that within the constant file, we have we will have a dynamic mesh dict constant folder. We will have a dynamic mesh dict file, which where we have to give the details of the mesh motion. And in this case, I'm just demonstrating the problem that I've already showed you, which is a moving cylinder problem. Uh, we have to first mention uh, a mesh motion library, which is in this case, the dynamic motion solver FB mesh, which I already showed you. Uh, and then we within that mesh motion library, we will have a motion library, which is the library of FB motion solvers. And then within that, we have to choose a particular mesh motion solver, uh, which I showed you that there will be some uh, displacement based solver, some velocity based solvers. In this case, I'm using a displacement Laplacian case. And for that particular displacement Laplacian mesh motion solver, we need to give this diffusivity constant or diffusivity method, the way the diffusion equation works or it's solved. And the method is here inverse distance, which is a mesh diffusion method. And we are using this method on the boundary, which is named as cylinder in my case. Okay. So my moving boundary is the cylinder in this case. And we are using a displacement Laplacian based mesh motion solver based on the inverse distance diffusivity method. So this is this is how the dynamic mesh stick will look like. I will show you in a in a while. And here it's it's kind of a summary of what are the other kind of uh, motion function we have. We use displacement Laplacian, but we can use depending on the version of open foam, whether it is foundation version or the open CFD version, you have multiple different motion functions such as solid body motion function, such as velocity Laplacian, such as multi solid body motion function, etc. And we have also a different set of diffusivity methods, such as inverse distance, such as, uh, you know, inverse point distance, inverse phase distance, inverse volume, et cetera, et cetera. So you can, you know, check and compare these different methods and its correlation with the accuracy of the solution that you get. And within all of these motion functions, what type of prescribed motion we can give by predefined functions? We can actually give angular oscillating displacement, angular oscillating velocity, oscillating displacement, oscillating velocity, time varying map fixed value, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the predefined function that OpenFORM already has. Now, as I told, if you have a very complex kinematics that doesn't fit to this predefined function, there are two options. One, you code it yourself and compile it within open form or second you create a trajectory of the motion of the body through its coordinates uh, of displacement and rotation at every time step and then you can input this trajectory uh, in a tabular form uh, within open form okay i'll show that in a moment and if you want to check how your motion function works, even without solving the whole fluid flow problem, you can use this solver, which is called move dynamic mesh. 
So this function, what it does is it just moves your mace motion based on your motion solver, but it does not solve your governing equation. So it is used mostly for a testing purposes where you want to check whether your solver setup is working properly or not. Right. So, so in the case of oscillating cylinder, I will show you the case file in a moment. But uh, while I mentioned already that the patch that we are going to move is termed as cylinder. So what should be the prescribed motion and where should we actually uh, give, the, give that information? So to define this motion of this body, we have to give this within a file called point displacement which is located in the zero folder and if you want to mention a velocity we have to give it within the file point motion u within the zero folder and a prescribed function such as oscillating displacement will look like this that you have to give the patch name within that you have to give the type of oscillating displacement with the amplitude in the x, y, and z direction, and the omega, which is the rotational frequency in radian per second, and uh, a value of uniform of 0, 0, 0. This is a dummy value for paraview. And in, in the boundary condition, as I've already mentioned, that you have to use the moving wall boundary condition in this case because uh, we are giving a prescribed motion. So the boundary condition in the velocity boundary condition, you have to give cylinder type moving wall velocity and velocity is uniform 0, 0, 0 at the starting at t equal to 0. Right. So does this make sense? This is how we set up a mesh morphing case for a moving cylinder. So what are the extra or additional things that we need to really take care of for a dynamic mass motion case? So in, in for a stationary body, we do not need these fields which are called cell displacement and diffusivity. But for a mass morphing case, when we have dynamic messing in place, we are actually solving for two new fields which are cell displacement and diffusivity which relates to the mesh morphing. And in the dictionary FV solution, you also need a solver for cell displacement. So for a cavity problem, for example, you needed only the solver for pressure and pressure, corrected pressure, velocity. That's it. We only have two state variables. But in this case, we are also solving for cell displacement because our mesh is moving. And so we should assign a linear solver in the FB solution file. So if you just copy the files from your cavity and just include dynamic mesh dict, it will not work. So it will show you error because you have to modify also your solution schemes. And uh, in the FB schemes where you use actually see different CFD schemes, you have to use this diffusivity method that is Laplacian of diffusivity and cell displacement. Okay. Now you can use different kind of uh, FB schemes for that, but mostly uh, the popular method chosen is Gauss linear limited with a coefficient of 1.0. Right. And this looks like this. So I have just done the simulation. I, I will show you the case setup, but uh, it basically looks like this, which you have already seen, and you can observe how the mesh motion occurs when we apply this prescribed oscillation of the cylinder. Okay. Now, the second method, which I already mentioned, that if you don't have a closed form kinematic equation for your motion, we can always input a trajectory. Uh, an arbitrary trajectory of mesh motion through a tabular form. In that case, my motion function is tabulated six degree of freedom motion. And for that, we need to use a DAT file, which is basically a, which is a, uh, which is a text file with all the displacement and rotational values uh, in an absolute form with time. So in this case, I am giving only five time values and the first three columns are the displacement along x, y, z direction. 
and the last three columns are the rotation about x and y and z direction all right so can you imagine this motion you will imagine that from 0 to 1 it basically i mean at time 1 it basically undergoes a displacement 2 in the y direction amplitude 2 at time 2 it goes x it moves from x and y direction both and then at 5 again in the negative direction at z uh, sorry at 10 it goes a five unit displacement in the x direction. So this is what we are just giving as a test case. And let us see how it moves. So first it go up, then it goes right, then comes below and then comes back. Right. So you can see that it's not a oscillation motion or it, it is not done through any prescribed function. It is just following the trajectory that we have told it to do right is it clear how you can input any arbitrary mesh motion through a tabular file i have one doubt so regarding yes. the diffusion term you are saying it is in a flow variable you are solving right so why is it a variable it is treating i mean it's like a constant terms that you are defining the displacement part i understand that has to be a variable yeah. But the other one, why it is a variable? I mean, no, it's it's variable in the sense that you are solving an additional diffusion equation for the mesh motion for this mesh, particularly for this mesh mor uh, morphing case. Okay, but do so, you need to really solve it? I mean, it is already I mean, defined. when you when you are defining the function, how are yeah. you going to deform this mesh? This what would be the deformed coordinates of the meshes in the next time step has to be calculated, right? And how do you calculate it? You calculate it as a solution of another diffusion equation. Is that clear? Okay. okay. Yes. yes. So when the body is moving, your mesh is also moving and you need to calculate. Like, for example, what will be my velocity field or pressure field in the next time step comes from the solution of Navier-Stokes equation. Mm -hmm. Accordingly, what will be my coordinates for the deformed mesh in the next time steps has to come as a solution of another governing equation, which is a diffusion equation in this case. Along with that displacement also. Okay. Yes, okay. exactly. I mean, this is that is correlated with the displacement because okay. based on the displacement, you are solving the next coordinates of the meshes, which is morphing. Okay, thank you. Right. Any other question at this point? Yeah, yes. hello. I have one question. Hello. Yes. So one question from my side is, uh, if we talk about dynamic mesh, so I think it's, is it only possible for the two dimension geometry? Because I think in three dimensions, it's going to be more complicated, right? No, but these, whatever algorithms I'm showing, they are valid for two, three dimension both. So we are not restricting. So any, so here I want to mention that any simulation in open form are three dimension. Okay. 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 But, but we are making it two dimensional by uh -huh. applying the empty boundary condition uh -huh. in the front and back phase. So when you will you are doing a simulation, you would see that there is a front and a back phase where in the boundary condition you apply the empty boundary condition, uh -huh. which tells the open form solvers that we are not solving the governing equation in the z direction or the in the third direction. All right. Uh -huh. And that's why we have only one single cell along that direction. But if we prepare our mesh in a three-dimensional way and give appropriate boundary condition. It works for three-dimensional problems also. However, I get your question that particularly mesh morphing becomes more complicated in yes. three dimension because yeah, your right. cell gets deformed yes. uh, in a in a more complicated way in a three-dimensional problem. But yes. that doesn't mean that it doesn't work. So you can tune your solvers accordingly to make it work. However, the other type of mesh motion strategies can be more appropriate for three-dimensional problems. Okay. Okay. Understood. Thank you. All right. Let's go ahead uh, with the further thing. And so here I am showing you an example of if we use 
two different type of method for calculating this mesh diffusion. All right. So I have already showed you that within the mesh motion solver displacement Laplacian, we are different diffusivity methods. So the first one, the first mesh motion you see is the diffusivity of inverse distance type of function. And the second one, I use an exponential function with a coefficient of 0.6. And can you visually understand that how the mesh motion changes? So this also answers the previous questions about why do we need a separate solver for cell displacement or with the diffusivity function? Because depending on what type of solver you use or what type of model you use to calculate this diffusion, uh, diffusion equation or calculate the deformed shape of the mesh, your mesh deforms in different ways. Okay. So the first one deforms in a way, the second one deforms in another way. And if we, if we keep on changing these coefficients, we can optimize uh, the mesh to deform accurately or in a suitable manner so that our solution does not diverge. Okay. Now, if we want to use multiple bodies with a prescribed motion, we have to use a different solver. And for that, uh, we can use a setup like this, where we use, we have basically, have, I mean, it's not a different solver in this case, but we have to use a different syntax for it. And we can use inverse distance function itself, but we can use two bodies. Here I have named as cylinder one and cylinder two. And you can see there are, these are the different types of, you know, displacement functions that we can use inverse distance, inverse volume, quadratic inverse distance, exponential, uniform, directional, etc., etc. Or we can also use velocity-based uh, solvers such as velocity Laplacian, but your syntax will change. So we have to mention both the patches of the bodies that we want to move. And here is an ex example of a prescribed motion that what type of uh, you know motion we can give. For example, in the first body of the cylinder one, I'm giving an oscillating displacement with uh, plus four in the y direction. And in the cylinder two, I'm giving a motion uh, plus two along x direction. Uh, both are linear oscillating displacement motion. And however, the omega, the frequency of the motion is double um, for the second body. So let us look into how this looks. Okay. So, so in the first animation, which I have not shown you the functions, you see that both are moving uh, in the y direction. So in this case, the commented part, you can see that the first portion shows you the commented part where I have said plus four along y direction and minus four along uh, y direction for the cylinder two. That shows you the first animation. And the second animation shows where one cylinder is moving in the y direction and the other cylinder is moving in the x direction. So this is an example of simulating multiple bodies using mesh morphing. However, as I've already told, that when there is multiple bodies, mesh morphing becomes more stringent in terms of your solution because in the middle portion, in the intermediate region, you can see that the, the deformation of the cells becomes quite large. The skewness and the non-orthogonality becomes quite large. So if you use this for high amplitude problem, your solution is going to diverge. Okay. Right. So, so this is another example of... Uh, airfoil tandem airfoil moving so it doesn't really matter what is the what is my body shape we can actually use different body shapes as per our problem and use the similar setups uh, you can see here i'm using quadratic inverse point distance and my first patch is airfoil downstream and the second is airfoil upstream and we could still use mesh morphing if we appropriately tune our solver and appropriately prepare the mesh, all right? So next quickly, I will just give you a touch upon uh, vortex induced vibration, which is a class of fluid structure interaction problem for which we can use six degree of freedom motion. And 
for for that the additional thing that we need is a solver for the structural oscillator all right in this case the motion is not prescribed so what will be the displacement for the cylinder will be calculated by solving a structural oscillator equation where the coupling term comes from the forcing from the flow solver so basically there will be uh, the right hand side of the structural equation will be coupled in a partisan manner with the flow equations uh, results such as aerodynamic loads. And we can use different type of solver for structural equation, which uh, can be Newmark, it can be simplistic. There are different class of problem uh, for which different methods works better. But you can see in this case that the motion of the cylinder is driven by the flow. So here I end my mesh morphing uh, uh, presentation and as I told again I'm just scratching the surface because we have very limited time and quickly I want to show you uh, what do we and how do we set up the overset meshes but I can spend another two minutes if you think you have any particular questions on mesh morphing do you want to ask any specific questions so on I have a small question so is this kind of problem can we just simply solve the mesh motion without solving the navius to just to check is yes mesh... that is the that is, is the strategy? yes i already showed you that if you can remember this um uh, the solver which only solves for mesh motion is called move dynamic mesh because that means we are not solving the fluid part yet no we are not solving the so, uh, governing equation of the actual flow which is navier stokes equation but we are solving the diffusion equation and uh, seeing the mesh motion so i'll quickly yeah. show you that uh, in a case folder but uh, let me also touch upon the overset meshes a bit okay Thank so in you. the Thank overset you. mesh as i have already explained it that we will have multiple disconnected meshes one laid over another so for example in this case we have a background eulerian mesh which is let's say i have named it as all then i have component two mesh which creates the refinement of a fine region of volume of cells around our actual body and the component mesh three is the cylinder which is our actual body that is going to move all right and we can use prescribed motion we can use six degree of freedom or we can use any arbitrary motion or fluid structure interaction using this and the overset mesh has different component meshes as i've already told and as i've already explained that the information from one component to the other component is transferred through the interpolation of the field variables in the overlapping surfaces between these component meshes all right and overset paths can intersect each other so it's it's basically even if your body comes very uh, one over another your solution actually does not diverge only thing that you get wrong interpolation or the interpolation error may increase and you may get inaccurate results uh, and Overset meshes can add numerical diffusion to the solution. Uh, so it is very clear that the interpolation is non-conservative. So your accuracy goes down from a mesh morphing approach to an overset method because inherently we have interpolation errors uh, incorporated, right? So, so we have to really tune our solver accordingly so that we can get accurate results and the most important trick or the tip for uh, doing an accurate overset uh, mesh simulation is that the cell size close to overset patches should be similar similar to the next background component mesh to minimize the interpolation error right so if the cell size at the patch overset patch is very different in different component meshes the interpolation error will be very large and you will get inaccurate results right so what is the grammar of overset mesh uh, we have uh, we have as i said we have to generate and merge component meshes 
and then we have to very uh, carefully define the overset patches where the interpolation occurs and then that there is another additional step that we have to assign zones in case of overset mesh with the grid priority such as the background mesh here all has a priority zero and then the refinement zone has one and then the actual cylinder has a priority of two so we have to actually use a function called set fields to mark those cell zones with different priority regions and then the overset solver computes the stencils do does it does interpolations and it assigns the cell type and there are two different type of uh, cell types in while doing this interpolation one is the acceptor cells another is the donor cells so the solution from which cell is interpolated to other cell uh, is called from donor to the acceptor cells and the solver automatically creates the stencils and assigns this different type of cell type and interpolate the solutions from the higher priority component mesh to the lower priority component mesh so in which the solution is interpolated from the cylinder mesh to the refinement zone and then from refinement zone to the background mesh clear so in this type uh, as i told that the cell types can be also named as whole where there is no cells at all the interpolated cells which are actually at the boundary and the calculated cells where we actually solve the navier stokes equation okay right and now coming to the interpolation methods which i quickly mentioned before that what are the different type of interpolations that we can use for overset mess uh, one is cell volume weight another is inverse distance another is least square okay so the cell volume weight interpolation method is fast order accurate it's very fast but it has problem with the boundary detection that means the whole detection uh, if it does not uh, detect the cell types which are holes inside the body of course the boundary of the cylinder uh, is not captured properly which will automatically affect the aerodynamic solutions right the inverse distance is second order accurate it's bounded and computationally expensive the least square is also second order accurate and it might become unbounded in some cases and it's also computationally expensive but it gives you the highest accuracy and you can actually debug uh, these overset interpolations or overset cases to check whether it is actually working properly or not using this debug switch in the control dict file, which is a separate issue. I'm not going into details into it. Right. So, so overset mesh, this is two examples of a prescribed motion uh, of an airfoil and an FSI calculation where we use the same six degree of freedom motion, but you can see that the component mesh is actually moving over the Euler and background mess. This is this is the basic, uh, you know, principle of overset messing strategy. There is another important capability of overset zone, uh, and the I would say that best advantage of it that we don't need a very high refinement <coughs> in everywhere in our mess like mess morphing. Uh, however. We can actually use a refinement zone around our obstruction or the body where uh, we want to analyze the our flow field or solution. And apart from that, outside we can use a very coarse mesh where we don't bother about the solution. All right. And we can also use a function called driven linear motion to move our refinement zone with our body itself. So in this case, you can see that. I've just given a uh, given a motion uh, of the body and I have a refinement zone around it which is also moving and its motion is actually stitched with the center of mass of the cylinder so that wherever this body goes I move a refined mesh so that my solution becomes uh, with high resolution around my body. And apart from that, the background mesh is coarse and I don't really bother about the background mesh results. 
And in this particular case, theoretically, you can give any type of displacement, any kind of kinematics, uh, and the solution will never diverge in case of open um, overset method because the cell is not getting deformed and there is no negative volume issue. However, the caution is that the accuracy is low and we have to use appropriate interpolation functions and solver setting to ensure that our solution is accurate. All right. Okay, so I think uh, I will just because of the time we have only 10 minutes i will uh, restrict my presentation only with these two methods uh, which is basically mesh morphing and the overset meshes which i anticipated that i won't have time uh, to talk about the other meshing strategies i just want you to you know now in the 10 minutes i want you to explain a bit on uh, the case that you are going to simulate However, I'm not going to show you the simulations, which I think uh, we have uh, our colleague who will help you to do the simulation. But in the simulation that you are going to actually simulate is actually a moving airfoil case using mesh morphing. And there, not only the dynamic machine we will uh, meshing, we will also show you how to set it up for a turbulent simulation. So. Uh, just I want to just give you a brief overview on how we incorporate the turbulence models. So you already know that within the constant folder, we have the momentum transport or the turbulence properties file where we mention uh, what type of turbulence model we are going to use. And um, turbulence is just a big C. So I'm not going to talk you up through the theoretical aspect of it, but I just want to mention that um, we can model turbulence using different approaches. One is the, the most popular industrial approach is the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes, solving the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation, where actually instead of solving the instantaneous field variables, we solve the mean field variables and for which we have multiple different uh, turbulence models such as k epsilon k omega sst spallet lms etc uh, so in today's simulation of a flapping foil you would use two different turbulence model one is k omega sst and another is spallet lms which are more accurate for an external aerodynamics problem and uh, we will explain to you how to set up these turbulence model parameters in your zero folder in the initial and boundary conditions and uh, how does this work. So for this, I want to just quickly show you the case files. Um, I have I just have 10 minutes. So I will share my workstation screen and show you the basic case setup of the problem that you are going to solve. And also, if time permits, I will also try to demonstrate to you the um, move dynamic mesh function, which you can use to see the mesh motions. Uh, before that, I can spend a couple of minutes uh, to answer if there is any overall queries or doubts. Do you have any particular query at this stage uh, relating to mesh motion algorithms? So, um, uh, hi, Shandan. You were speaking about fluid solid interaction. Yeah. So, open so open form doesn't have its own uh, structural uh, like uh, software, right? So, there's a way of doing two way simulations. So is there a way of connecting open foam to a uh, stress analysis and um, doing a two-way simulation? Yes. So it depends on what is the class of FSI problem. So the, the kind of FSI problem that I demonstrated using six degree of freedom rigid body motion, that does not solve the structure as a continuum, right? So the governing equation for the structure is just an oscillator equation, mx double dot plus kx plus cx dot equal to f. Now that open form has different solvers to solve it. Also, open form has uh, 
a solver, it's not true that open foam doesn't solve for structural stresses involving, let's say, for example, Euler, Bernoulli beam equation, etc., or plate equation. Uh, you might know the solver which is there in open foam called solids for foam. Previously, it is also called FSI foam, which is located in foam extend version. But in the uh, open CFD version, we now have solids for foam. Uh, it is developed by uh, Professor Philip Cardiff from UCD. And that has a finite volume based structural solver. So you can either solve the structural dynamics or structural mechanics problem alone, or you can also couple it with the Navier-Stokes solver in a strong coupling um, partition approach. That is one way. The second way, uh, which I think you are trying to ask, can we couple any external structural solver uh, with my uh, with our open foam solver, right? So that's also possible. We have different third party couplers. Uh, for example, one more popular now is Precise. Uh, so we can use some third party coupler, which can couple open foam Navier-Stokes uh, solvers with the external structural solvers such as Calculix, Deal2, etc. So there are multiple ways of doing it. Uh, the, the last but not the least, you can yourself code your structural solver within the open foam and then couple it with the Navier-Stokes solver if you know how to couple a fluid and solid solvers. So any options among these can be used for solving your problem. Clear? Um, yeah, thank you. All right, so I'll just open a new Right, so I think the the case file that you will be shared. So um, if file is there, is this case file already shared with them and the video? No, no, the case file is not shared. Okay, so after my session, it will be shared with them, right? Yes. All right. So basically, as I as I told you that this flapping airfoil pro problem, you are basically going to solve it using uh, two different turbulence model. One is K omega SST and the other is pallet alumnus model. And in the K omega SST and pallet alumnus, I have told uh, one of my colleagues to you know set up the cases for two different Reynolds number uh, so that you know how to change the physics in the presence of different Reynolds number. Now, I hope that everybody is aware of the non-dimensional analysis of fluid mechanics and the Reynolds number is nothing but the velocity scale times the length scale divided by kinematic viscosity. And in the simulations that you are, that you are going to do, we have set the velocity scale to be unity and the length scale to be unity. So the Reynolds number is going to be governed by the kinematic viscosity. So we are going to change the Reynolds number using a fictitious value of uh, kinematic viscosity, but it doesn't really matter. We don't really have to give the exact value for water or oil or air. Uh, if we keep the Reynolds number same, the physics remains same for any fluid. All right. So that's the major concept here. And so we set the Reynolds number by Reynolds number equal to length scale one, velocity scale one. So Reynolds number is just the inverse of kinematic viscosity. So we set the kinematic viscosity value based on what Reynolds number we want to set up. Now within the zero folder, as you said, uh, as you can see that apart from pressure and velocity, we have here the other three parameters which comes from turbulence model. One is because this is K omega SST, we have K omega value and the new T value. New T is turbulent viscosity. And uh, my colleague will actually explain and show you in the video that you will be shared on how these values are set up. Uh, I'm not going into the theory part of it. Okay, so then we have constant folder. Within that, we have dynamic mesh dict, and I just want to show you this before I end my session. We are using a particular motion solver, let's say interpolating solid body. Within that, we are using oscillating, rotating motion and our patch is in the mesh named as airfoil. We are giving a coefficient of mass there, I mean the pivot point. And then we are actually giving the oscillating rotating motion, uh, which has an amplitude, uh, which has an origin, an amplitude and the omega, okay? So these values can be changed and you can change these values to change your kinematics and see what type of mesh motion you use. 
uh, and then in the momentum transport file in the foundation version has the model of turbulence which is k omega sst and uh, this rans type of libraries or rans type of methodology is termed as ras which is the rans reynolds average navier stokes turbulence method and apart from that in the transport properties we set the value of nu which is function of the reynolds number and uh, we have a geometry which will create the mesh width uh, by using a comment called uh, extrude mesh so i'll quickly show you that in the system we have uh, the function object block mesh dict which will be used for meshing control dict which has the solver parameters decompose per dict if you want to run the simulation parallelly extrude mesh dict to extrude the geometry mesh from the geometry and fv schemes and fv solution okay right and now we have prepared a script which is called all run which just copies the original zero file to a zero current zero file then it runs the block mesh file to create the mesh and then extrude mesh command to create the actual airfoil mesh from the geometry we use decompose part to par uh, to decompose our total domain into different processors available and then we run the simulation in parallel so it will be another new thing that you will be running that how to run a simulation in parallel and after running in parallel we reconstruct the solutions using reconstruct part and that's all okay so i think uh, i i've just rushed through it but you will have one hour with a recorded video and the case folder to play with it and my colleagues are there to help you uh, hands on so my suggestion would be that you try this diff you in the dynamic mesh dict you have been given one particular you know mesh motion you can actually change this mesh motion or parameters of this mesh motion to you know visualize what kind of mesh motion you are getting and also you can do the simulation for different turbulence model and for different reynolds number to observe the flow physics uh, how you are getting and uh, with that i would stop here i know that it is too much to cover in this short time but i hope you have got an overall idea of the different capabilities of solving external aerodynamics problem and uh, yeah i mean um, i will take five more minutes uh, to answer any overall query if you have any yes okay. uh, professor chan there was one query by shiva uh, the question is uh, is parent child meshing approach is similar to the dynamic meshing what do you mean by parent child meshing Shiva, can you just uh, unmute yourself and uh, explain your query? Uh, in the meantime, if anybody else has any query for Professor Chandan, I have a question. Uh, is there any other uh, like for an overset mesh? Is there any other CFL criteria that is how much one mesh should spread over the other? Is there any velocity or CFL criteria related to that? Not really. So overall, we we can actually uh, what is suggested for overset mesh because it. it incorporates a very high value of acceleration linear and angular acceleration if your body is like for example a free falling body under gravity so in those cases what i my suggestion is that you can start the simulation with a very low cfl number or a very low time step and slowly as the as the solution gets stable you can increase it on the go like with time you can actually manipulate your cfl number or the time step while uh, the solution has reached a stable value now this recipe changes from one simulation to another so it depends really on the physics of the problem and what you are trying to capture yeah thank you uh, my question is regarding turbulence so how do we initialize the values of uh, k omega and uh, nu t and all yes so that i didn't explain because my colleague haris is here so uh, you will be given the video uh, a recorded video of the tutorial of the case folder that you have been shared with where he has explained step by step how to set up those values initial and boundary values and then um, you can do it but i can quickly share my screen and show you uh, 
how you can do it. Um, I, we don't have much time, but uh, still, I wanted to show it. So, for example, there is an extensive documentation available for this kind of different turbulence models in open form. If you think about K omega SST CR stress transport model, uh, the governing equation, you have to know the governing equation about it. So, I didn't really go into the theory of it, how you, um, you know, how you modify the normal Navier-Stokes equation to a Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation with this turbulence model. However, the initialization part, so the K and omega, K is nothing but the turbulence kinetic energy and omega is the turbulence specific dissipation rate, right? So uh, you there are recipes or, or basically initialization suggestions that can come from the turbulence intensity and also the coefficient, uh, different coefficient of the model such as C mu. So for example, in K omega SST, you can initialize the K with this formula where I is your turbulence intensity. For example, you are doing an wind tunnel experiment and you have a 5% turbulence intensity. So that will be your I value. And U reference is your free stream flow velocity or the reference velocity. And omega will be a function of k and c mu, which is a coefficient of this model. And the L is the reference length scale. Similarly, if you go to the spallet LMS model, its model is different. It models the turbulence AD viscosity in a different way. So for that, uh, you have a different way of initialization. And I think uh, Harish is going to explain to you uh, in the video that you have received on how to initialize this kind of uh, values. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. But sir, if, if we are in an enclosed domain with uh, no inlet, then how can we initialize uh, turbulence uh, variables? The reference length and velocity is not dependent on your boundary. So if you are in a quiescent flow, you don't have any free stream velocity, you must have some velocity of the body which you are taking as a reference velocity for your problem and you have to calculate based on that so you have to first decide what is your length scale and velocity scale of your problem and then accordingly you have to do it okay sir thank you sir, sir okay if we don't have any intensity data with us so like we are not conducting any experiment then uh, is there any empirical relations so that we can find out the no, you have to assume one you have to basically go to the literature and understand uh if you for i mean it depends again what is your problem right if it's a flow past a rotating or pitching airfoil you can go through literature and see when they have conducted experiments depending on the blockage of the wind tunnel or uh, water tunnel or whatever, depending on the experimental setup, what is the range of turbulence intensity that you might get? When you are doing simulation, it's a theoretical uh, assumption, right? Unless you are comparing or validating your simulation with respect to an experiment. So I would say that in wind tunnel or in water tunnel uh, plume, you can use 5% five, 5 of your 5% to 10% turbulent intensity. So this should be an input parameter. There is no but empirical relationship about high turbulence involved like in turbo machinery or rotating machineries, then I think input turbulence may be different from what we have intensity. Exactly. Uh, so so it, it will vary from one problem to another. So you have to think about the physics first and what should be the incorporated turbulence intensity. So we have to validate for different intensities. Then yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so with this, I think it's time to move ahead and uh, start the hands-on session. And uh, I would really like to thank you, Dr. Chandan, for this uh, interesting session. I hope all the uh, participants have immensely been benefited by your uh, lecture. Thanks a lot for joining. Thank you. So I will leave the session. Uh, mm -hmm. So Haris, uh, I hope Haris has already uh, trivially explained everything in the video and uh, he's here to help you all but if you have any specific questions uh, you can email me also thank you everyone i hope it was uh, useful to you yes definitely you. i think it was thank you professor chandan